Houston last week until they collided with Houston. The Oilers shared first place with Pittsburgh, but played nothing like the Steelers last Sunday. Mike Rozier rushed for 99 yards, and although this touchdown didn't count, Warren Moon's passing provided plenty more scoring opportunities for the upstart Oilers. Houston exposed Pittsburgh's steel curtain defense to be only a shade of its old self, give or take a hit. Although Moon led AFC quarterbacks in interceptions, it was the Steelers that seemed to be playing right into the hands of the Houston signal caller. Moon accounted for both Euler touchdowns thanks to some timely blocking. Here blitzing linebacker Mike Merriweather is held up just long enough for Moon to connect with Drew Hill. While the Oilers win improves their record to six and three, there's a third team contending for the AFC Central title. Make no dog bones about it. While Browns fans are crazy over their dogs, Buffalo did its best to quiet the Cleveland crowd in the game's opening quarter. Mark Kelso returned this fumble 56 yards for a touchdown. But minutes later, Cleveland proved that you can indeed teach an old dog new tricks. After being bit by Cleveland's defense, the Bills were then devoured by Browns quarterback Bernie Kosar. Kozar threw for 346 yards as Cleveland is now pointing to this week's showdown with Houston to determine the true number one team in the AFC Central. The Falcons were four games out of first place in the NFC West when their work ethic looked like it might finally pay off against the Bengals. Lloyd Dixon's 44-yard catch and run was Atlanta's first touchdown in three games and gave the Falcons an early lead that looked to be enough against Cincinnati. You remember Cincinnati, the team so good it can tackle itself. Well, this time the Bengals actually cashed in on a last-minute opportunity for victory. Larry Kinnebrew's two-yard run with 23 seconds left gave the Bengals a fourth-quarter win that should do wonders for slumping team morale in Cincinnati. There's no morale problem in San Diego. The Chargers own the NFL's best record, and their fans are sporting a new wave for the occasion. The wave may not be permanent, but San Diego's defense definitely has a new look. The look on offense is much the same. Top Gun Dan Fouts firing to tight end Kellen Winslow. Against the Raiders, Fouts and Winslow hooked up six times, including San Diego's lone touchdown. Add that to three field goals, and you have a fourth quarter lead too much for the Raiders to overcome, despite a last second touchdown. Chargers held up. To your advantage to go up and play those folks. But can I choke it? <laughs> no. <laughs> but so you won't be facing this. You'll be facing the Boz and some of those other people up there. You know the uh, the Chargers have gone up the last five years to take on the Seattle Seahawks, and they have yet to win a game up there in the last five outings. And I'll tell you, 
This is Tatuya, is this bird right here. Do you know that your cousins up there, the Seahawks, have not treated people very well? Let's take a look now and see how they treated the Green Bay Packers up in the Dome last Sunday. After taking the Bears down to the final seconds the previous week, maybe Randy Wright and the Packers weren't the pushovers everyone had assumed. They certainly didn't look at early on in Seattle. Keith Paskett's scoring catch helped build a 13-7 lead, but the Packers then showed what they really are capable of. Green Bay lost three of its six fumbles and also was intercepted twice. And if that wasn't bad enough, the Seahawks also were guilty of five turnovers, but made up for it by unleashing a legitimate weapon, Kurt Warner. Warner's 57-yard touchdown highlighted his 123 yards rushing. The 6-3 and three Seahawks hardly were impressive in their 24-13 victory, but a win is welcome any time. Welcomes also were in order in Kansas City, marking the first NFL start for Chiefs quarterback Frank Sire and the first appearance of the season for Jets nose tackle Joe Klecko. Klecko pounded his way to one of five Jets sacks as Sire's baptism truly was one of fire. Cornerback Carl Howard picked off two of the Jets' three interceptions, and while Sire may have felt very alone in his debut, New York quarterback Ken O'Brien found an old friend to help him out of a jam. Freeman McNeil was welcomed back to his starting job by rushing for 184 yards, and when O'Brien didn't go to his star running back, he always could turn to a stellar receiver. Al Toon's 18-yard scoring catch was the only touchdown in the rain-soaked 16-9 New York victory. The loss was a club record eighth straight for the Chiefs, while the five and four Jets again seemed to have their heads above water. In Miami, the Dolphins began the season like a fish out of water, but two straight wins had them back on line in the playoff hunt. And early on against the Colts, they looked like a great white shark ripping through Charlie the Tuna. Miami stormed to a 14 to nothing lead and 21 first half points. Perhaps to think of the Colts as contenders was just another fish story. But if the Dolphins weren't frightened of the Colts, they certainly should have cringed at their own overall performance. Miami blew any chance to put away Indianapolis by committing five turnovers, as all three Dolphin fumbles wound up in the arms of a Colt. Meanwhile, the cold offense executed to near perfection, helped by the return of quarterback Gary Hogaboom. Hogaboom threw for one score, and the Colts did not commit a turnover or allow a sack. Then, of course, the presence of number 29 made the offense appear even more flawless. Eric Dickerson rushed for 154 yards as the Colts ran wild over Miami. Here, number 64 guard Ben Ut cleared away the nose tackle while blitzing linebacker David Fry ran right past the ball carrier. Albert Bentley scored two touchdowns and helped Indianapolis rack up well over 200 yards on the ground. The Colts' 40-21 victory ended the 14-game losing streak against the Dolphins. Backup Jeff Rutledge played Jeopardy. The answer, we can both count on it. The question, who is Lionel Manuel? Number 86 caught four balls for 105 yards as the Giants tried to keep up with R.C. No 
Number 12, Randall Cunningham, is the quarterback, not the coach, but he wears the Eagles crown. Running for 71 yards with a touchdown and throwing another to Keith Byers, it looked like the crown had delivered another jewel. But the Giants were going to put a stop to the Eagles' flight through the NFC East. George Adams tied the score, and then kicker Raul Alegre delivered a 52-yard field goal to give New York a 20-17 victory, their third of the year. When it comes to delivering, Dallas's Herschel Walker believes in the adage, ask and you shall receive. He wanted more playing time, and he got it. Unlike Sims, Rodley Jan Walker, Steve Grogan and the Patriots didn't get the answer they needed. And the passing game brought as much consolation as winning the board version of a game show. Number 38, Ron Francis's interception for a touchdown left New England taken aback. But in Dallas these days, a back is becoming synonymous with the back. Walker's 173 rushing yards and five catches for 59 yards kept the Cowboys close. His statistics had outplayed the Patriots, but adding up the numbers after a Tom Ramsey to Stanley Morgan touchdown, New England led 17 to 14. A last minute Dallas field goal sent the game into overtime, and then Herschel wasted no time. His 60-yard run gave the Cowboys a 23-17 win and a 6-2 record in overtime games, while the Patriots are 0-9 in OT. Tampa Bay is also a team that has to pick up on a record. In franchise history, they have won only 19 road games and lost 68. In Minnesota, the Bucks couldn't run, and Steve DeBerg went to the air. Calvin McGee's 20-yard touchdown catch had the Bucks on top. But while Tampa's nine rushes were the fewest in club history, Minnesota ran for 224 yards, the most since 1976. Darren Nelson carried 17 times for 103 yards and was complimented by rookie Rick Fenney's 40 yards and a touchdown. Though the Viking defense may not be the purple people eaters of the 70s, they are more than quiche eaters in the 80s. Led by number 56, Chris Dolman's two sacks that both led to fumble recoveries, the Vikings got to DeBerg four times and rejoiced in their 23-17 win. Washington's Doug Williams is not the juice, nor was he rejoicing. He was merely rejuicing. Coach Gibbs may have created a sticky situation for himself when he replaced Jay Schrader with a veteran Williams. But Williams gave the skins double the pleasure. First, a 16-yarder to number 24, Calvin Bryant. And on the next possession, he found number 84, Gary Clark. Williams finished the day 11 of 18 for 161 yards and two touchdowns with no interceptions. Unfortunately for Detroit's Chuck Long, the same could not be said. Four times he was picked off as number 28, Daryl Green, managed a hat trick in the Skins' 20-13 victory. The Skins are to the lines are, if you come upon a character who's a cross between a DC Comics reject and Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead, you're in San Francisco. Against New Orleans, the 49ers connected on two Herculean heaves, including this one from fullback Harry Sidney, that would do justice to that of any superhero. Jerry Rice hauled in two touchdowns and in seasons past would have spelled doom for their weak rivals. However, any resemblance between these Saints and those of recent history is purely coincidental. A major factor in New Orleans' rise to prominence this year has been the play of their special teams that once again struck for the big play.
Johnny Poe's touchdown return of a blocked field goal attempt gave New Orleans a 23-14 fourth quarter lead. But the 49ers, who were riding a seven-game winning streak, were intent on seeing victory number eight. When on fourth down, Joe Montana hit a wide-open Ron Heller for the go-ahead score. Throughout the year, the Saints have relied heavily on their kicker, Morton Anderson. Anderson's left foot has often been the difference between victory and defeat, and last Sunday was no exception. His successful 40-yard field goal with a minute remaining proved to be the winning score. The Saints are now working on their own win streak as their third in a row leaves them only a game behind division-leading San Francisco. A team that has moved into the Saints' old digs, the seller of the NFC West, is the 2-7 and seven Los Angeles Rams. However, last Sunday, running back Charles White did some settling in on his own. Here on a safety blitz, the Cardinals' Leonard Smith, number 45, targets the quarterback, only to overrun White. White's 47-yard touchdown highlighted a 213-yard rushing performance, a career best, and helped stake the Rams to an early 14-3 lead. But for the comeback artists of 1987, what's 11 points? Two touchdowns, including this Neil Lomax to Robert Awald hookup just before the half ended, put St. Louis out front. The Ram falloff continued with the second-half kickoff a play that typified their season thus far. The official was no obstacle for Derek McAdoo, who recovered for another St. Louis score. But the Rams regained their composure and returned the special team's favor. Jerry Gray's recovery put the Rams back in control of the capital C. A Mike Lansford field goal as time ran out capped an 11-minute, 23-play drive to give the Rams only their second win of the year. While wins have been the rarest of commodities for the regular Rams, Chicago's regular quarterback hadn't lost in his last 25 starts. So when Jim McMahon tossed for over 300 yards for the first time in his NFL career Monday night in Denver, the Bears seemed truly invincible. In the first and third quarters, McMahon threw three touchdown passes and ran for a fourth as the Bears outscored the Broncos by a whopping 29 to nothing. For the other two periods, however, Chicago would have to contend with a red-hot John Elway. Elway baffled the blitzing bears with some fancy footwork and an aerial display that lit up the mile-high sky for three touchdowns. Denver came from behind for a 31-29 win proving that all you need is 376 yards of offense from your quarterback, and you, too, can beat the Bears. Oakland Raiders gave their city its final division championship. A touch of 